this is really the question I wanted to ask. Um, and I was asked before I started to do this to give a little rundown on my background, although you've already heard lots of syllables about it. Uh, started out for a couple of, for a decade or so doing um, skyscrapers in Japan and master planning in Berlin and then uh, collaborating with Lord Norman Foster on the design of the first purpose-built terminal and hangar facility for a commercial spacecraft um, at Spaceport America in New Mexico. Um, we did, here's some of the orbital vehicles that we've done, uh, proposed a module for the International Space Station, um, the first space inflatable habitation module, a commercial orbital station, and some surface stuff. Surface stuff. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, inevitably, I get dragged into doing cabin architecture, seating, lighting, etc., for actual spacecraft, which was a little bit amazing to me. I had never really thought I would be reading up on avionics, canards, drag, you know. Uh, but there we were. We were doing some of that and learning that basically the number one thing we had to do with the challenging design was throw out any assumptions we made about it. So, for example, a seat is not a seat at all. It's got nothing to do with sitting. When you're coming in, a 13 G's and the plus Y, 9 G's and the minus Y and 6 G's right up your butt. <laughs> sitting is not the problem. Okay. <laughs> Um, and we've been able to convert a little bit of those ideas into uh, some more familiar things, like we were asked to do a revision of the hospital bed by Metropolis Magazine. I'm still trying to partner with somebody to get it prototyped and out there, so if anyone's interested, I know we're not supposed to do that. Oh, no. um, birdhouses, and most recently, I've been actually designing textiles and garments. So why not, right? It's much nicer to be able to do something that doesn't have to go up to the White House level for clearance every time you want to change color. <laughs> but what we're here in Houston to talk about today, what's particular about Houston in this talk, uh, we're looking at a part of right here, this photograph. I was four when it was taken. I know I'm dating myself, but that's all right. You can find all that information whenever you want to. Christmas Eve, 1968. This is the first time in our awareness that a part of the Earth's biosphere was able to get away from it far enough to take a picture of our whole planet from another body. Seven months later, a couple of us walked on the surface of that body, and the first word they said was? That's right. You know how many Americans were employed at that time by the space program? 400,000. And the things that we were inventing uh, in order to solve this completely unique problem together have, I would argue and will argue today, basically fueled most of our economy for the past four or five decades. Um, what, kinds, what is technology, first of all? We talk about high tech. We talk about Houston as a technolo technological center, Austin as a technological center, Silicon Valley. And yet, Often I find that when I'm talking about technology, it's a little bit, I'm meaning something a little bit different than what people are saying around me or pe what people are expecting. To my mind, the root of the word is always a good clue as to what it is. Technology is made up of techne, or the ability to make things, and logos, or the knowledge, the wisdom, the meaning behind the thing. So you really don't have a substantial technology in hand unless you have both the crafting and the knowing. Um, and it's not a new argument to make that this country is officially, formally, economically, no longer a making economy. By offshoring all of our making, uh, we are depriving ourselves, perhaps, of a critical part of that issue in inventing a new technology. Without the techne, what are we really producing? Um, Large-scale R&D efforts on the private sector, Bell Labs, Xerox Park, these things are gone. Um, the kind of massive investment by the government in things like the Apollo program, which created an extraordinary wealth of national intellectual capital, is basically drying up. Um, meanwhile, there is a vast maker revolution in this country. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, what's going on in the sort of handmade nation universe and Etsy.com and people making things, and yet it's kind of unplugged, right? It's not really a part of our formal economy. Most of these fabulous makers of whom we may be fans, 
probably aren't really making a living or they don't need to make much of a living at this point. Um, and so, and yet things are, in, things are in the doldrums, even though in theory, and as we see in practice in small areas, like the wonderful things we're seeing happening in the city of Houston, um, we do have the stuff to get out of it. My concern, and usually I'm the person that gets to come to the conference and go, you guys have no idea what fabulous things are going on, right? Today I'm not that person. <laughs> Sorry, you've already heard a lot of fabulous though, right? You've had a lot of, you know, the sugar coating. So, um, but the thing that troubles me, okay, and this is the part where you listen like the plane's going down, because it is, okay, is how does a democratic republic conduct great projects? I think about this problem when I'm designing a fork. I think about this problem all night long. I think about this problem when I put a bag clip in my daughter's hair to hold it up. No nation in the history of, earth, of the earth has failed to conduct great projects and remained significant. The Great Wall of China was a great statement right, um, about what China was about at that time. The Apollo program was an enormous statement about what we felt we were about at that time. Kennedy had promised us this, but it only really mattered because we bought into it and we believed it. Um, and in that whole period between the government, the WPA, a lot of government involvement, and then things trickle off after World War II, and then <laughs> the Sputnik moment. 1957. And Khrushchev, who is inheriting from Uncle Joe Stalin, none of our tricky problems about whether Joe Sixpack or Joe the Plumber cares at all about what we're doing, right? None of the problems of political will. When Khrushchev heard, hears from Korolev that they need O-rings, he just calls a shoe factory and says, now you make O-rings. And they made O-rings. And the O-rings worked eventually. Um, what Sputnik companion did for us was probably even more than what it did for the Soviet Union because it woke us up. First of all, it gave the military industrial complex an excuse to really start spending on the Cold War, right? We had all those Germans. We had the better Germans, maybe. Who knows? We've all read those books, probably. <laughs> and mainly they were educating the hell out of their kids and keeping their cars real clean. And we weren't putting them to work. But, uh, yeah, you should read the books. Um, <laughs> so specifically, of course, there was the spending on the space race. Um, but I think in the more lasting sense, there was communications. Because what ends up happening is that we realize, hmm, when we start Project Mercury, gosh, we have to station people on barges in the middle of the Pacific with a typhoon coming in in order to communicate with our spacecraft during the second that it comes. This is really, this is really hard. And so what happens within just minutes, uh, basically, of Sputnik um, and of the Mercury program starting up is the launch of Telstar, Intelsat. By the late 90s, Iridium, a completely commercial geostationary satellite array uh, with of much smaller satellites than the big TDRA system, but nevertheless completely commercial, is up there and functioning. And by now, no one really has a good count of how many commercial civil and military assets are in fact up there on orbit. Not really a good thing. But, uh, <laughs> but I want you to notice something important here, which is that starting right around, given how, it, how long it takes for technolo technological programs to wind down, right around the time that a political administration changed, right, from one party and ideology and concept and sense of priorities to another, is when the new stuff basically starts to wind down. And we, we start feeding off of what we had with Apollo. Skylab was, was the remnants of a, of a rocket that was supposed to have taken Apollo 19 to the moon. Um, and I'm sorry, I went ahead too soon. Um, around 1968, when we were still doing all of this and we were, we were funded like crazy, we started the design of the, what was to become the space shuttle. 
And the guys who had been the chief engineers on Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo were leading this program. And this program, nonetheless, and in that atmosphere, partly because of funding reduction, but partly because of the complexity, took 12 years to get the first one launched. Okay? This matters a lot because of what we're dealing with today. When we start to slow down and look at what it takes to replace the space shuttle, I myself personally have worked on one, two, three of the efforts that have started in the 90s, but really heated up in the past decade to replace the space shuttle. They may have had various engineering benefits or drawbacks, different vehicles, you know, different, different applications, but what killed each of them was politics. And in fact, I would strongly follow ancestors of mine who started the first Tea Party in defending to the death the rights of all the people and their representatives to have a determination in what we spend our money on. But we're never going to get to Mars like this. Okay? I mean, what was the most amazing thing to me when I came to NASA was to realize that we actually knew what it would take to go to Mars. Really? We do. And it'll take about 20 years. It'll take about 20 years of continuous funding at a near Apollo-like level. But look at what we get out of it. We get communications. We get the internet. We get software. You know, would any of us try to live without that smartphone, without the cellular communications, without, sure, there's Tang and there's Velcro. Um, <laughs> but we all know that those were, in fact, invented by, like, nutty garage inventors, right, who had the stuff out there, but nobody was buying it. And then NASA turns up and goes, hey, actually, we need something that's kind of like orange juice but powdered. Huh. Well, Um, you know, can you imagine? Um, so, individual innovation is there. It's going to happen, like the maker revolution. We're doing it. We've got it. The question is, are we as a people, within the scope of our political will, willing to fund it? Are we willing to support it? What is our Sputnik moment? Now, I would pose to you that an example of a Sputnik moment might be if, say, a major nation with enormous military and economic power were to announce its intention to build a military station on orbit. China did that two years ago. We sat in our hands so hard our fingers turned blue. So the political will isn't there. And maybe it shouldn't be, but my question is, now that we're about to retire space shuttle, How are we going to move on? What do we do next? What is the next thing? How are we going to conduct great projects? How are we going to project what we believe ourselves to be about at a historical scale into our economy and into the world? Now, well, I've, just, I've just talked most of that, so I'm just going to go ahead and slide forward. There we go. Here's an example of how much we value the makers. I love the... Uh, little note about the LED-based traffic lights. Uh, let it be said, I certainly have noticed those. <laughs> 1998, I was approached by a group of electrical engineers who were working in a basement in a building near the Johnson Space Center, and they said, hey, you know LEDs? I'm like, well, yeah, you know, LEDs, the little things. And the, no, no, we can make a light fixture out of it. Mm -hmm. OK, because I'm tasked with doing things like finding exploration class technologies to support a human mission to Mars. Now you're talking about three years. You definitely want to, don't want to have to change light bulbs, right? You're talking about absence of gravity. Well, the light needs to be something you can actually kick because you're floating around, etc. And here it came. And these guys wired these things up. And I gave them dimensions and configurations. I gave them illumination requirements. We massaged them into a figure. It actually got approved for the project that we were doing, which, of course, itself subsequently succumbed to the political process at the NASA budget review level. Not one of those people was able or permitted or encouraged in any way to, say, attempt to spin off and patent this. I actually did try to get the company we all worked for to pursue the development of these, and I was, I was told, uh, well, could we put one in a fighter jet? Yeah. 
Of course, I hope those guys <laughs> are stopped at those traffic lights today and looking around. Because, of course, once an idea is out there, as we know, it's probable that some other maker is going to come up with it. If you don't jump on it yourself, someone else probably will, if it's really that good an idea. Now, see, I, might, I myself would like to have that Lotus Elise in my driveway. But anyway, I, I have a copy of the weird old fixture myself at home. So, Now, the one hint that I have about an idea as to how we might overcome some of the vicissitudes of time and politics in a democratic process and nonetheless do great things is the International Space Station program. I love this picture. It makes the hair jump up all over my arms and back. That's, a, that's the sun that, that the station is crossing. I mean, that's an image so much bigger than here we are not only taking a look at our planet from the solar system, we're projecting ourselves like nature in that scale out into the universe. And the International Space Station program is one of the most extraordinary things I have ever heard of. Never in history have 15 nations, two of whom are still at war on the surface of the Earth. Technically, no treaty ever signed between Japan and Russia. Uh, contributed together billions of dollars to build a science platform no one owns. There's no law governing that station. Groups of engineers who have all agreed about functionality and budgets and commitments control everything about that space station. And when one administration said, no, nah, we don't need to return the space shuttle to flight, we don't really want, the other administration said, oh, no, 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 we have put this money on the nail. You have to finish doing this. And so the space station was completed. So international, multinational, multi-democracy efforts joined together may help to keep things on track. But frankly, the reason I'm coming to you guys with this question today is because I really don't have a good idea of what a real answer could be. And I think we're all dead in the water sooner or later unless we can come up with one. And uh, because literally, this plane is going down. This is the space shuttle Atlantis, also transiting the sun last year. And in a couple of weeks, she'll do so for the last time. And then she'll come home. And she'll get taken apart and given to the Smithsonian. And we will no longer be a space-faring nation. See, that's it. That's my bummer talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but that, that's it. Okay, thank you.